Addiction is really self-destructive behavior. People can choose to do that in, in out of all kinds of motives. But I, I have been persuaded that addiction really is an, 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 well, using drugs and getting ensnared by them is really an adaptive me mechanism. It helps people cope. And when we lose sight of that, uh, we lose sight of the fact that that's why people don't want to give it up. It's not because they're being recalcitrant or they're they're just being obstinate in their in sticking with their choices. They can't give it up because it serves a purpose. And when a person does that long enough, it become it really um, experientially. Uh, becomes engraved in brain patterns and the way we 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 interpret things the way we choose to cope with it and 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 so a person who who has become fully addicted isn't isn't really choosing self-destructive this self-destruction although it looks like it they are they are they are really stuck in a rut that they've they've learned that this behavior helps them to cope, and they're going to continue to do it with a vengeance, and they're reluctant to give it up. Which is why, in recovery, we have to find ways to convince people that there are other ways to cope. You know, the the major coping mechanism when it comes to stress and difficulties in life that human beings have, and most in a most healthy way, you uh, recruit our relationships. You know, I, I I feel really bad. I go to my wife and ask her for a hug or a snuggle, or a, and and I feel better. Um, the infant, the child falls, hurts themselves, and screams, and mommy comes a running and holds holds them and says to him, "It's going to be all right." And she soothes him. Our relationships are meant for that to soothe us, to perk us up, to give us a sense that we're, that we are somebody. But when people don't have those in their, life, in their life, if they don't have those kinds of relationships or those experiences that they can fall back on, then how do they cope? Well, they cope by turning to other things, other things that are external to the person. And that's when they can get in trouble not just with drugs, obviously, with behaviors as well. So gambling, uh, gaming, internet gaming, um, sexual behavior, and other ways in which people behaviorally can cope with the stresses in their lives. Now, that that's not to say that these things are are always helpful, because in the end, they turn on you. And, and unhealthy ways of coping become their own problems. It brings to mind a couple of things. So I suppose the first is that whenever we're infants and we do hurt ourselves or we're in distress, you know, we have these built-in systems that basically attract the attention of the caregiver. You know, we might cry or whatever, and then the caregiver comes in a healthy attachment relationship and will help to soothe the child. And then the child learns... Right. You know, if I'm in distress and I do this, then I can get my needs met that way. Whereas child, a child, child learns from that behavior to regulate themselves over time. Exactly, exactly. But we, but, but we still need to turn to other people at times. A hundred percent. And but what what this brings to mind for me is, you know, if it if that is happening, uh, that's great. That's great. But there be some situations where the mother might not be present, or the mother, or the the caregiver might not provide that kind of regulation. So the child then has to find, even from that young age, it learns that it has to find different ways to sort of soothe itself and 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 regu regulate, regulate themselves as well. So would you say that people with insecure attachment from those young, age, young ages would be much more prone to addictive patterns later in life? What I would say is that, um... And I, and I think the data back bears this out. People who have insecure attachments, and, and there are 
varieties of those, and there are different kinds of insecurity and attachment, are prone to a number of different um, negative outcomes as they go through life. Addiction is only one one of them. Um, could be that the person turns to criminal behavior. You know, there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people in our prisons who who really what's underneath a lot of that is both trauma and insecure attachment. There are people who don't have addictions or criminality in their in their life history, but in fact they have um, physical illnesses, chronic physical disease, chronic pain, for example. Um, and other kinds of chronic diseases that are, when you when you look at them deeply enough, they go back. They they are rooted in traumatic reactions that um, flood their system with cortisol and other kinds of neurochemicals that wear down uh, the healthy responses of the body, and so they are unable to fight off other kinds of toxins or other kinds of uh, allergens. Um, and so they, you know, the, 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 ACE, the people with the ACE studies have looked at heart attack, increased cardiovascular disease, increased cancer, uh, and other kinds of illnesses that can also be the outcomes of early trauma, early misshaping of neural and physiological and emotional systems. Your basic question was, are they more prone to addiction? Yeah, 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 they're more vulnerable to it. It's such a complex thing. You know, I if I if I'm a freshman in college and I've never had a drink before, this was me. <laughs> and I've never had a drink before, except maybe on once in a while at a family party. And I go and somebody invites me to a party in my first week of college. And I go and I have a hell of a good time. I I drink a good bit; doesn't have to be a lot. But I I drink and I and I realize that it makes me much more sociable. It helps it helps me deal with the opposite sex better. It um, lubricates my social relationships, which is in itself rewarding. It doesn't have to be just what happens in the brain. It can also be the rewards can come in my social life. And so the next time I'm invited to a party, I go back and I do the same thing. This be starts to become patterned behavior. And, but if I don't have that kind of, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm just a much more anxious, anxious person. And so what in, gets engraved in my physiology is not use of chemicals to cope, but the fact that I can just be very anxious and the anxiety in itself uh, becomes a kind of coping. Um, some people, you know, there are people, I, I, I believe that there are a number of people who have uh, rageaholism and pe people who learn that being able to rage at something to um go out of control of one's emotions, that's a kind of, it's a way of zoning out from life that can become very um, captivating. And so that can be a way that a person copes. Mm. So there are all kinds of different ways. For some people, their anxiety, their stress goes into their gut. For other people, it goes into their backs. There are lots of different ways that people can cope with uh, negative early experiences and later on experiences. It doesn't have to be addiction. Mm, mm. So uh, maybe a central idea in the in the book and in the work, Ollie, is this idea that addictions are substitutes for genuine connection. And another point you make that I think is extremely interesting is that addictions are they're a jealous relationship in the sense that, you know, they like to crowd out other social relationships and that will give, that will, the person will give that priority. Can you maybe expand a bit more, a bit more on that? Yeah. The, the jealous relationships, yes, they are. 
We are creatures of habit. And when we find that something works to, to help us either, either do things that are really positive or, or something works that um, helps us cope with stress, because rewards are not just positive. Rewards come because we get released from negative effects. So the reward system is we'll search for ways that I have learned help me cope. And so when when if I if I have learned drinking, for example, or using cocaine or marijuana or gambling are are going to help me, it becomes more competitive. We, it is easier for us. Um to return to that way of coping again and again. I feel I feel stress. I I'm brain makes the connection between stress, need relief, go to my preferred way of doing that. And that's how that's largely, I think, how the the engraving of different behaviors and or drugs in in, in one's life becomes so powerful along with the fact that it actually works. I mean, we can't ever forget that drug use works. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that people people are right when they say, you know, these things really help me. It's, it, it's kind of another way of thinking through the self-medication hypothesis. Um, that people really are self-medicating things. Mm -hmm. But we sometimes miss what they're self-medicating. It, it, it may be deeper than we think. It may not be the self-medication of stress in the moment. It may be self-medication of a, of a screwy um, self-regulation disorder. If you're interested in seeing the full session and 34 others like it, you might want to check out the Holistic Recovery Summit. This is a revolutionary free online conference which brings together 35 world-leading clinical psychologists, researchers and practitioners who will share with you their best practices for mind, body, social and spiritual approaches to addiction treatment, enabling you to be at the forefront of evidence-based care. With a lineup including Stephen Porges, Janina Fisher, Ian McGilchrist, Pat Ogden, Anna Lemke, Stephen Hayes, Richard Schwartz, and 28 others, this really is a once-in-a-lifetime learning opportunity. The best bit is it's 100% free to attend live, and you can do so from the comfort of home. You'll also be able to upgrade to your recordings and certification pass after registration, although this is entirely optional. For more information, please check out the sign-up link in the description.